Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 12th night of Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening as we discover the beauties of the countries of Croatia and Slovenia with the two people that I would most like to guide me around these countries, Cameron Hewitt and Tina Hiti. So please join me in welcoming our first guest for the evening, Cameron Hewitt. Cameron, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to the show. Hi there, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight for the midpoint of our Festival of Europe. Um, I wanna just get started right away. We've got a lot to cover. I'm gonna introduce my co-host Tina in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you about what's going on this week here at Rick Steves, these three weeks here at Rick Steves Europe. Um, as you probably know, we've got a great team. I'm a one of about 100 people who work in the home office in Edmonds, Washington, and about 125 or so tour guides, most of them based in Europe, including our special guest, Tina from Slovenia, coming up very shortly. We're in the midst of our Festival of Europe. This is a, a new thing we're trying out this year to make our content more uh, virtually accessible to more people. And so far, it's going great. We're at exactly the halfway point. Three weeks, 22 nights of these kinds of presentations. Uh, Rick's doing 17 of them himself. I've just done three in a row to give him a little bit of a break. And then he's right back at it with Sicily tomorrow night. And each night, we're joined by one of our favorite Europeans to tell us about their favorite part of the world. Uh, by the way, uh, we've already uh, archived a lot of the past, actually all of the past events. So if you missed any of the ones there on the left side of your screen, you can find them on the Rick Steves website. The same place where you signed up for this, you can watch the recorded version and anything coming up will be on our website a day or two later. Lots of great content coming up for the rest of this festival. One I wanted to call out in particular, this coming Monday, we've got a special event called Ethical Travels in a Warming World. This is uh, Rick and our special guest, Craig Davidson, who's the CEO at our company, Rick Steves Europe. We are well aware that being in the travel industry, we leave a huge carbon footprint. And with Rick's generous support, Craig has innovated a really creative approach to creatively and meaningfully mitigating our carbon footprint. And it's an amazing program that Craig has put together. And I've seen his presentation, and that's something to not miss this coming Monday. One of many great presentations coming up as part of our Festival of Europe. By the way, something else happening on Monday, we're going to do our second drawing. So for these three Mondays as a part of this festival, a drawing for a free one-week city tour to Paris, London, Rome, or Istanbul, your choice. Uh, you can register for that at the link on the, on the screen right now, and you'll be sent that email that Lisa mentioned tomorrow with more information about how to sign up for that. The other thing to know about during this festival, through the end of the month, January 31st, if you sign up for any Rick Steves tour, you get $100 off. So this is a great time if you're on the fence about doing a Rick Steves tour, and we, we managed to nudge you off that fence. Hopefully, this will sweeten the pot and give you an extra 100 bucks off. But be sure to use that special promo code FEST23 when you sign up. We have a multiple, we've got basically 44 different tour itineraries. And tonight we're going to talk about a couple in particular down there in the southeast corner of Europe. Most of what we're going to talk about tonight is covered on this wonderful Best of the Adriatic in 14 days tour. Many years ago, our co-host here, Tina, and I helped kind of design this tour as sort of the best possible look at these countries, Croatia, Slovenia, and a little bit of Bosnia. And we think it's still an amazing itinerary. We barely had to tweak it at all from that very uh, first tour that we did years ago. A couple of stops at the beginning in Slovenia, and then we head basically north to south through Croatia with a little detour at the end into Bosnia, Herzegovina to the city of Mostar. So we're going to be covering all these places on the talk. And after to we actually see all of these places, we're going to walk through it when you can visualize the places and explain more stop by stop. We have another tour that includes these countries. That's more of a grand tour that includes a lot more than just these countries. It's the three great cities of Eastern Europe, Prague, Krakow, and Budapest. And then the finish of this Best of Eastern Europe tour is some beautiful stops in Croatia and Slovenia. Plitvica Lakes National Park with the waterfalls, Rovin on the coast, and the beautiful Lake Bled in the mountains of Slovenia. We'll talk more about those, uh, especially at the end of the, of the presentation. But I want to reassure you, if you're not really interested in doing a tour, this presentation is also designed to be equally useful, if not more useful, for independent travelers. So almost everything from here on out is going to be applicable, regardless of how you're going, or even if you're just doing some travel dreaming. If you are going to go on your own, we suggest equipping yourself with the best possible information. And uh, from my personal opinion, the best possible information is the book that I wrote. This is the Rick Steves Croatia and Slovenia guidebook. I've been the co-author of this book from the very beginning. I just got back in October 
from nine, uh, about a month updating this for the ninth edition. The new edition is not quite out yet, and it won't be out probably until later in the summer. So if you're going in the first half of 2023, you might as well pick up the one that's available now. Um, but this covers all of the stuff that we're talking about tonight in our show and lots more besides that. So that's a good tool for anyone who wants to travel to Croatia or Slovenia. Uh, I'm going to show you a few pictures just to whet your appetite and talk a little bit about what we're going to do tonight. And then I'll introduce Tina and we'll be off and running. And I just want to say, if you're not familiar with these places or you're not sure kind of what's what is there to do or see in Croatia and Slovenia? I mean, you can sum it up in a word. It's beautiful. These are some of the most beautiful places you're going to see anywhere in Europe. I'm just going to give you a little taste of the beauty that we're about to see in these slides for the next uh, hour or so. You've got incredible big cities like Dubrovnik with thriving nightlife. You've also got just absolutely stunning coastal towns. This is the town called Rovin in the Croatian region of Istria. Incredible beaches. This is a great place just to be on vacation and go for a dip in the Adriatic Sea. Incredible mountains that rise up directly from the sea. I mean, this again, it's, it's like all the great scenery that you can imagine turned all the way up to 110. It's a spectacular place. Also rolling hills, beautiful vineyards, incredible waterfalls, not to mention Alpine Splendor. This is literally in our guest host Tina's backyard. This is Lake Bled in Slovenia. Incredible place just for the natural wonders. There's also a lot of cultural richness in this part of the world, especially here in Bosnia Herzegovina, which is a quick two hour trip from Dubrovnik or the Dalmatian coast. You get a really vivid Muslim culture. There's a, a high percentage of people who follow the Islamic faith here in Bosnia. And in general, the people in this region are wonderful and they're interesting and they're fun and they're great conversationalists and they speak great English. If you're wondering if there's much of a language barrier, there's very little language barrier. People here speak excellent English and are just fun to get to know. We also have some exceptional tour guides in this region. Some of my favorite tour guides of all of our Rick Steves tour guides are in the Adriatic region. Here we've got Marian and Barbara. They're a husband and wife team based in Ljubljana. We're going to be joined tonight, though, by a very special guest, Tina Hiti. If you've watched our TV show on Slovenia, you might recognize Tina. Going back years and years, anytime Rick or I need some help with uh, any kind of expertise around Slovenia, Tina's the first person we call. And every time I'm in Slovenia, I make sure to spend some time with Tina. This is us back in October attending one of her son's uh, hockey games. Uh, she's not only a great tour guide and an incredible expert on Slovenia, but she's a good friend of mine. So I want to a uh, very warmly welcome and introduce you to our guest guide tonight, Tina Hiti. Hello, Tina. Dobar večer, Cameron. Dobar večer, everybody else. Yes, good to see you all. Great to see you. Now, what time is it there in uh, in Slovenia? Um, don't even ask. Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. That's very, very heroic. How long how exactly have you been guiding for us with Rick Steves Europe? Well, I, I started 23 years ago. Wow. Yeah, that's when I started. Actually, that's exactly right, because you and I started at the same time. We kind of came up together. Well, in, in honor of tonight, you and I have prepared a few fun uh, drinks and treats from Slovenia. So what are, yeah. you, what, are you, what are you imbibing tonight while we watch the show? Well, you know, at three o'clock is a little hard to eat something. So I just opted up for some drinks. And of course, because we started just, you know, a few months ago, I said we need to drink ah. some co co cocta. Of course. You have it, right? I have a vintage bottle of Kokta. Very good. It's yeah, very do you want to tell everyone what, what it, this is not Coca-Cola, it's Kokta Kokta. Tell us about what Kokta yeah, is. Yeah, actually, Kokta was created back in the days of Yugoslavia, and it was created just to have, just that we had something that was resembling Coca-Cola, because everything that came from the West was super cool. And it's similar to coca-cola although a lot of people say that it's more similar to dr pepper hmm, has i can no see that pepper. yeah i'm um, gonna give it a taste hold on a second it's I gotta... a little sparkling so yeah it's it's kind of like a let's see like a it's like an herbal an herbal cola yeah it's it's i would say it's an acquired taste it's if you're expecting coke it's not coke but <laughs> I've actually, I have Kokta every time I'm in Slovenia and I've gotten to the point where I kind of crave it when I cross the border. All right, so we've got some Kokta. What else Cheers. do we have tonight? Um, and one thing about Kokta, whenever oh, yes. we drink it, we like to say that this is the drink of our youth. It Very brings nostalgic. Us youth forever, you know. Yeah. I'm over 70, as you know, Cameron, but yeah. <laughs> I, I keep on drinking this one. Very mm. good, excellent. And uh, let's see, what else do we have? I, I think you and I both have got a nice cup of tea to uh, 
to keep well lubricated. My cup of tea happens to have a Slovenian on it. Do you know who this is? Of course I know. This is Joža Klečnik, our most famous architect. Yeah, the great I don't have a cup like that, so Cameron, I need to pick one up. We're going to talk about Jerzy Plechnik later. I have a whole collection. I have four mugs with Slovenians on them. That's probably more mugs than most Americans have uh, with Slovenia. Yeah. What, what kind and, of tea do you have inside? Well, I have the Planin the Planinska chai here. The Planinska. Okay. This is the the mountain the mountain tea. Then this is very okay. good for your throat. It's very good if you're not feeling well. From Mountain this Herbs, is, what do you, what do you have? I have Mountain Herbs, but I don't have the one in the package. I go and pick them up myself. Oh my gosh! Months. Yeah. You've got hand-harvested mountain herbs. <laughs> yes. Wow. And then the best thing to add into our herbal tea is, of course, honey. Of course, honey. honey. as well? Very I put good. some honey in mine. This is some Slovenian honey. Yeah. And then I've got okay. some bee pollen also, also from Slovenia. Oh, here. you have a very fun glass because do you see in the bottom of that glass that Cameron holds as well? There's oh, a, yeah. There's a little bee. It's the Carniolian gray, actually. This bee is the indigenous species in Slovenia, and every cup that comes either with pollen or honey, if it's from the association of beekeepers, it comes with that bee. So it's that's a mark of quality. Side. Yeah, right over here. It's the mark of quality. You can always check it. I already know because the shape of a glass, it's like a tea or like a little mushroom, but um, and it comes in small, bigger and bigger versions. But if you will ever be in Slovenia, check for that bee. Great. It means it comes from very, very um, hardworking hands. Top quality. We're going to also talk more about Slovenian beekeeping a little bit later as well. Um, yeah. Great. But for now, I think we should probably just uh, head right on ahead and get into our slideshow because we've got yeah. a lot of ground to cover here. Oops, sorry. Okay. I chose the wrong screen. One second. No worries. All right. Let's get going with our slideshow. And just to give you a quick overview of what Tina and I are going to be talking about here tonight, we're going to cover Croatia first, and then Bosnia Herzegovina Mostar, which is down at the southern tip of Croatia. We're going to kind of have as our grand finale Slovenia, which is actually up in the north part there. Then we're going to work our way kind of north to south through Croatia. But this is just to give you kind of your bearings and see what all this is about. And I think for each of the countries, so we're talking about Croatia, talk about Bosnia Herzegovina just a little bit, and talk about Slovenia. Uh, Tina and I have kind of brainstormed, what are the things that we love about these places? What do we associate with these places? And I'll start for Croatia. When I think of Croatia, it's the first thing I think of is this. It's just a beautiful seaside country. You saw that long, long coastline on the map. Beautiful, shimmering, crystal clear water. It's a great place to go swimming. It's a great place for kayaking, any kind of water sports. I mean, there's something about uh, Croatia that to me just sort of says vacation. And I know for Tina, your family also feels that way about Croatia. Yeah, actually, the island that you're just showing off right now is the island of Hvar, and this is where we spent at least three weeks every summer. Um, so you're kind of killing me with this picture, but <laughs> um, I would just like to go over there right now because at the moment in Slovenia, we have a huge amount of snow. But yeah, this is where we all vacation. Even in the times of Yugoslavia, we all vacationed on Croatian coastline. You know, it was a must to have a little bit of summer, summer seaside um, vacation everywhere. Um, a lot of institutions in Yugoslavia actually um, had small little houses on the beach where everybody could go and vacation. So that was another little plus of living in Yugoslavia. But we are coming to Hvar for many, many years. And it's just for that easy mode of life, at least for a few weeks of every year. So yeah, this is one of my favorite places in Croatia, for sure. And you say that you're, I'm torturing you with this picture, but I'll say you've tortured me plenty with your pictures of Havad, because every time you're there, you send me pictures of you guys hanging out at the beach and having an amazing dinner, and, and I, I'm usually the one who's jealous. So it's, it's turnabout is fair play, Tina. Um, yeah, something else I think that I associate and Tina associates with Croatia that you might not think of is Roman ruins. You might not realize there's some really spectacular Roman ruins in the in the country of Croatia. Tell us why that is, Tina. Yeah, because, you know, this part has always been a meeting point of different cultures. And there has been so many people that have passed the area from the Celts to the Romans, to the Venetians, to Napoleon, to Austro-Hungarians, and all of them have left a mark. Um, Rome is actually a pretty significant one. I would say that outside of Italy, probably, um, we do have some of the best preserved places. This is the sixth largest amphitheater in the whole world that still has an intact outside wall preserved in completion. 
which is very rare to find, and you can find it in the city of Pula. Plus, if you go down to the coastal town of Split, you can find one of the best preserved Roman palaces uh, belonging to notorious Diocletian, but nonetheless, it's still preserved and we can marvel at the techniques of Roman architecture over there. Um, so it's really incredible. The history of the region is something that um, is very eye-opening, but also very intriguing. And it's, I think the layering of history is interesting. When you're in certain places, you can almost see the layers almost literally physically on top of each other and really get a sense of that. I mean, something that I also love about Croatia, there's all these wonderful, beautiful, characteristic, kind of higgedly, piggedly old towns like this, places like this that you can just sort of get lost in. And that takes us to the, the first stop. Now we're going to kind of do a geographical swing through Croatia from north to south. So starting in the northern part of Croatia, this is one of my favorite small coastal towns, maybe my favorite small coastal town in all of Croatia. Small coastal town. Dubrovnik is pretty amazing, but that's big. And this is the town of Rovin. And Rovin is an absolutely delightful little seafront town. And it's kind of a characteristic of all of these different coastal towns in Croatia. They're all a little bit different, but a lot of them have the same features. So, for example, you have got a big, colorful harbor that's bobbing with boats. You've got a giant cathedral, usually with an even more giant bell tower overhead. And then you've just got all these endless little lanes and alleys that you can kind of poke around and explore. And it's just a complete delight. And Rovin is a particularly charming and characteristic town. In fact, on our uh, Eastern Europe tour, we spend a couple of nights here to give people a little vacation from their vacation. And this is the region of Istria that we're talking about. It's this kind of wedge-shaped peninsula in the northern part of Croatia, just south of Slovenia, where Tina's from. And I think your sister lives here in uh, Istria, doesn't she, Tina? Yeah, she actually lives very close to Ravin. If you look at the map, actually, her family name now is on the map with that little wine glass because that's in the family as well. It's the Matosevic winery. Oh, cool. Uh, <laughs> and just, just beneath the eye of Istria. So that's where my sister lives now. And I go there very often. And actually, I must say, in the last couple of years, I really... Um, got to know Istrians pretty well. They are very hardworking fo folks. Um, and this is a very traditional zone. Uh, what I think I learned about Istria is that every single one of them um, has a job, but every single one of them also does something at home. Um, most likely they will make their own olive oil. Most likely they will make or dry their own prosciutto and they will make their own wine. And when you come visit, their olive oil is the best, their prosciutto tastes the best, and of course their wine is the most amazing of all. And whenever you come to Istria, at least when I go visit my sister, I always go on an empty stomach right now, because when you go and visit all these people, they will always treat you to things. And some of those things are just incredibly delicious and wonderful. Um, Istria is really well known for some of the best olive oils in the region, and you would be surprised that in Istria, Actually, um, some of it, some of the olive oils um, have gotten a lot of world titles, um, rewards, and in so many respects, they get better oils than in Italy or Greece or Spain, uh, which is quite a big deal, I think. That's that's um, very impressive. And yeah, and, and, and it's also chef, yeah, right. and it's chefs like Gordon Ramsay that actually use their oils for cooking in their shows. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I think the other nice thing about, just from a sightseeing perspective about uh, Istria, is it's pretty compact. So when you're in Rovin, for example, you drive less than an hour south, and you come to this beautiful big city of Pula, which is at the southern tip there. And this is this amazing, uh, really well-preserved amphitheater from Roman times that Tina was talking about earlier. And so on our tours, we make sure on our Adriatic tours, people get a chance to walk around inside this incredible amphitheater from Roman times. And it's not just the amphitheater, the whole old town of Pula, everywhere you go, you'll run into a triumphal arch from Roman times, or you'll run into an old temple. And it's just, it's a really amazing place where you can see these kind of layers of history. One of the best places in Croatia, I think, for these Roman ruins that we're talking about. Another great thing about Croatia is the interior of Croatia has these kind of rolling hills and kind of oak forests and uh, beautiful vineyards and lots of hill capping towns, really beautiful hill towns. In fact, on our Adriatic tour, we spend a couple of nights in one of these towns to really dig in and enjoy the nature and the countryside of Istria. And like Tina was saying earlier, there's an incredible amount of produce that comes out of that countryside. You were telling us about those incredible olive oils uh, that are really world-class. And there's something else that's very, very famous from Istria. So tell us the other thing that people should look for in Istria. 
Yeah, actually, a lot of people don't even know that Istria is one of the largest areas for truffle hunting. Um, a lot of people think that you can only find truffles in Italy or France, but no, actually, Croatia is one of the largest truffle founding areas, um, especially the area around Istria. And they are on the menu everywhere. And actually, this is also where they find the world's largest truffle. And just to get you into the spirit of how the people in this region are, when the Guinness World Book of Records came to measure the giant truffle, um, up until that point, the truffle was locked into a fridge. And the owner, the guy who actually found it, was offered humongous amounts of money to sell that truffle. But he didn't want to because he said, I just want the people from Guinness World of Records to come measure it, to put it inside of the book, and then we'll make a big party and we'll invite all the local people so we will eat the whole truffle ourselves. Well, <laughs> That's great. And the tourists that came and visited. But if you come to any of those um, inner towns in Istria, I'm more than sure that some of the dishes that you'll find on the menus will include truffles. This is actually a wonderful Fuji um, locally made pasta with shredded truffles on top. And I have to say, when I close my eyes and I think of Istria, I, I taste truffles. It's just something you really come to associate with this, this part of the country. Uh, but we are actually leaving that part of the country. We're heading south through Croatia. Most of the big sites in Croatia are on the coast. But here's an incredible exception to that rule. It's deep in the interior of Croatia. And I said at the beginning, this is a land of incredible natural beauty. And in all of these natural wonders, this might be the most amazing, I think, of those natural wonders. This is called Plitvica Lakes National Park, Plitvica Lakes National Park. And it's basically a Grand Canyon that's filled with all these terraced lakes. And there's all these waterfalls and cascades flowing between the lakes. And they've just done an incredible job of creating this network of boardwalks that let you walk across the surface of the lake. And in a lot of cases, you're literally climbing up the side of a waterfall or you're walking right up the middle of a waterfall. I've never been to a national park where you have such close access to such incredible natural wonders. Uh, there's a beautiful part where you actually walk along this big wall of cascades. And I, I like to say, first you hear the water and then you see the water and then you feel the water because you actually get the spray kind of drifting over the, the boardwalk. It's a, it's a really beautiful place and really an intoxicating spot in Croatia. In fact, we love this so much. This is on both our Adriatic tours and our Eastern Europe tours. They both go here. It's the one, one of the few points of, of overlap there. And I mean, Tina, you take people here all the time. Do you have any, any, any thoughts about this? Yeah, just don't be discouraged. You know, if um, it's, it gets to, it can be a bit crowded, so start as early in the morning as possible. And then do Plitvice also in the off season, because Plitvice is a place where you can go throughout the year. And if maybe in the winter, you do not see all the water running down, well, some of these falls can be frozen and that's a pretty um, beautiful sight uh, to look at as well. So don't be discouraged, no matter what month of the year it is, even if it's pouring down rain, Plitvice are still wonderful and beautiful. And you can see some of the natural habitat. So in all seasons and in all kinds of weathers, I think this is a beautiful destination to go to. I think I told you once, Tina, years, years ago, I think it was 2002, one of my first ever tours that I led, it, we woke up and there was a heavy snow had fallen overnight. And we were the only group staying at the hotel who still went out and did the hike. And I just remember it was magical. All of these paths and boardwalks were they were covered with new fallen snow. We were the first people in the park that day, and it was it was spectacular. Yeah. Um, speaking of spectacular, we're going to head back towards the coastline, and we're heading from the north of the country towards the famous Dalmatian coast. And if you're heading from the northern part of Croatia to the southern part of Croatia, you're almost certainly going to go through this wonderful big city of Split. Now, a lot of people, when you imagine Croatia, you picture small towns. You picture these little coastal villages like some that we've seen so far. But actually, Split, for being a big city of about a quarter million people, is also a really beautiful, fascinating, fun place. It used to be thought of mainly as like a transit hub, but I think these days it's a great destination in its own right. It's just a wonderful place. And one of the things I love about Split is there's this beautiful pedestrian promenade that runs right along the shorefront, right along the harbor front in front of the old town. And it's just all hours of the day and night, people are out sitting, enjoying, people watching. It's just a great scene. Yeah, and, and actually Cameron, if I might, if I may, uh, probably it has also one of the best activities that you can do in Split, and that's coffee drinking. Coffee culture in this part of the world is very important. And be sure whenever you do that, 
um, that you won't be the only one. This is where in Split all the business is being done. This is where you meet your boyfriend or girlfriend. You get your job. Um, you actually can answer all your questions that you have. You can also eavesdrop to some neighbor tables. Um, but the only thing that you need to learn is that the minimum time to spend having coffee, and that's a small cup, not the giant latte cup, uh, would be an hour. And there's no maximum. And any time of the day, going for coffee is a very big deal over here. And this is the best spot to do it when you are in the city of Split. So be sure that besides seeing some of the historical sites that Split has, uh, to also take time to drink some coffee, because really this is one of the major things to do when you're here. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like a lot of Mediterranean cultures, you know, in Italy, they have the famous passeggiata and in Spain, they have the paseo, which is this custom of kind of going and just strolling up and down the main street in the evening. And it's interesting when you come to split, you don't, again, you might not associate that with Croatia, but it's a Mediterranean country. And that's exactly what happens all along the Riva. And it's, I just love getting swept up in it. If you, if you wander down to the Riva and people are out strolling, Stow your guidebook, forget about your itinerary, and just stroll with them and stop for an hour for a cup of coffee. I think that's that's great advice. And as Tina mentioned, there's also some amazing historical sites in Split. We've been talking about Roman ruins. And I mean, the, I think what you find in Split is it's kind of mind-blowing because the old town of Split is actually an old retirement palace of a Roman emperor. Now, I didn't say that the palace is in the old town. I said the old town is the palace. And what happened was uh, the uh, Roman emperor Diocletian is somewhat notorious. He was one of the only Roman empire emperors who retired uh, uh, sort of willfully. And he decided to come back to this part of the country, the empire where he came from here on the Croatian coastline. And he built this gigantic retirement palace where he lived for the rest of his days. And after he died and after the fall of Rome, it's interesting, local people kind of cannibalized the palace and they moved into the halls of the palace. So the halls of the palace became the streets of the old town. And this is the main entryway, the grand entryway of the palace, which has now become the main square in the center of Split. And it's just really incredible to, again, peel back those layers, walk through. You can actually go into the cellars underneath and you can see where they actually built up the foundation to be able to build this palace. It's kind of like a modern daylight basement almost. It's all incredibly well preserved. And you step into that cathedral that we just saw with that big bell tower and you realize, well, yes, now it's a cathedral, but it actually was originally built to be the mausoleum for this Roman emperor Diocletian. And as you look around everywhere, you see these sort of layers of history stacked on top of each other. I just, it's incredible. I think uh, it, it, there's no, there's few places that seize your imagination when it comes to ancient sites like Split. It's just incredible. Uh, so from Split, it's sort of the transit hub for the coastline. So from here, we're going to head south along the famous Dalmatian coast, which is where a lot of the most famous destinations are in Croatia. There are so many things to see and do along the Dalmatian coast. There's islands, big and small. There's lots of choices. I'm going to talk about one island in particular, and that's the island of Korčula. Korčula is one of our favorite islands because it's sort of a nice mix of accessible, but also still pretty rustic. It's far enough away from Split that it's not too ritzy and not quite as expensive as some of the ones closer in. This is actually where our uh, Best of the Adriatic Tour spends a couple of nights because we want to give people a chance to just relax and enjoy a small Dalmatian coast town, explore this beautiful old town, uh, just kind of have the place of themselves for a few days, maybe go to the beach, go out for a boat ride, what have you. Uh, but that's just one of many beautiful islands if you're planning your own trip. Another one we love is this island called Hvar, which is the place that Tina was saying that she also likes to vacation. Tina, what is it? What is it about these islands that is so enticing? What do you What do you do when you <laughs> go and spend three weeks on Hvar? Um, pretty much nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know that doesn't sound like a, a perfect vacation because a lot of times. When you vacation, you usually go fast. You go and try to see as much as possible, tick as many boxes as possible. When we vacation from this part of the world, we just want to go away to a place where we can hide away from the rush of every day. And we try to encompass or in, in how would you say, um, circle up two activities that Dalmatians, which where Juar and Korčula are, do the best. One is the concept called Pomalo, which means a little, a little bit every day and then Laganini, which means slowly, slowly. So a little bit and slowly, slowly every day. Do not do anything in a rush, do everything slow. And I think when you come to these islands, this is 
uh, where you can do that almost. You can do a master's degree in it. And <laughs> it's such a wonderful place. So we, we really don't do nothing. We bring here our car. We park the car. We don't even go anywhere with our car. We just stay on the beach. We go swim, uh, fish, um, eat, drink some wine, and hang out with friends that we um, have in this, in this region. And that's it. Three weeks in a row. It's a <laughs> so it's... Re- yeah, it's a very good recess. It's a very lazy kind of vacation, but that is how it's supposed to be. So it's Pomalo, which means little by little. Yeah. Little by little. Laganini? Yeah, Laganini, which means slowly, slowly. Do not okay. do anything with a rush. That explains a lot about, about Croatia. Yeah. yeah, this is not a place to be in a hurry. This is not a place to be efficient necessarily. It's a place to take yeah. it easy. Look at those incredible sunsets, uh, you know, yeah. dream about going to those islands that you see off on the, on the horizon. It's just a beautiful place. And Cameron, I would say, especially down from Split onwards and then down towards Dubrovnik, you have to really take in this concept of Pomalo and Laganini because people will not do it fast. Even if you're there, they won't change for you. So that's really important because sometimes... As travelers, we're a little anxious and we like to get things going. But believe me, here they will not change. They haven't changed up until now and they will not change just because you came and visited. Um, So the sooner you adopt the concept, the better it is for you and the better experience you'll have. All right. Well said. Uh, Now, there's something else I know that's very successful, very popular in Dalmatia. It's one of Croatia produces some excellent wines and Dalmatia, specifically the Peljashats Peninsula, which isn't an island, but it kind of sticks out towards the islands. Peljashats Peninsula has some of the best regarded wines in all of Croatia. This is a, a great place to learn about some other aspects of Croatian uh, delights. And, and that is you can go and tour a variety of wineries, try some local wines. And actually, Croatian wines are becoming extremely well respected. They're starting to be known internationally. They're starting to show up on international menus uh, you know, international wine rating systems are taking note. So if you're interested in wines, I, I was just here for about a whole day back in October. A wine expert from Dubrovnik, Dubrovnik took me out and drove me around this Peljashats Peninsula. And I was just so impressed with the quality of the wines and how how passionately people feel about it here. So that's another interesting component of traveling in Croatia. And I do want to say, just to give you a quick rundown of the kinds of foods you might have in this region. You might be wondering, what do people eat here? We already talked a little bit about some of the gastronomy up around Istria, but I'm going to do a quick rundown of kind of the sorts of things you see on menus in this part of the world. A lot of meals begin with a combination of dried meats, so prosciutto, and here they call it prosciut, which sounds like the Italian prosciutto, prosciut. Uh, Cheeses, olives, that sort of thing is a very common first course. Seafood is very popular. Fish is very popular. It's very common to get a whole fish grilled like this. Other versions of seafood, some things that you might not see so often here stateside. An octopus salad is really delicious. The first time I had an octopus salad, I wasn't so sure, but if it's done well, it's really fantastic. Lots of fresh shellfish. This is a scallop. Oysters are popular. That's something that's become really trendy with foodies in Croatia. You can literally pull up to a bay on that Peljashats Peninsula, a bay called Malistone, and someone will like haul up a big cage of fresh oysters and you just literally pop them open with a knife and slurp them uh, off of the shell just right there as you stand out looking out over the Adriatic. It's something that's really popular and really delicious here. Pasta is really common on Dalmatian menus, Croatian menus in general. There's all the standard kind of spaghetti carbonara and spaghetti with tomato sauce. There's also some really fun, interesting local pastas. This is an example of a local pasta served with some shrimp. So it's, it's really fun to try just not just the international stuff, but the local Croatian specialties. Something else you see on a lot of menus is grilled meats. This is a dish called chevap or chevapchichi. This is mostly common in the Bosnian part of this region, but actually it's kind of now popular throughout Slovenian Croatia. When Croatians and Slovenes have a backyard barbecue, they don't have hamburgers and bratwurst. They have chevapchichi, a really delicious, really well-seasoned meat. And that red thing you see in the background is a condiment called Ivar, A-J-V-A-R, Ivar. It's absolutely delicious. It's made with um, red peppers and some tomatoes and some eggplant, I think. And it just has a really nice kick to it. Um, And that there, if you want sort of the classic quintessential traditional Croatian feast, it would be usually cooked on an open fire like this using a method called peka. Peka is the name for like a metal baking lid. And what they do is they, they have a pot with all sorts of meats and potatoes. Sometimes it's uh, veal, sometimes it's octopus. 
and they cover it with that lid and then they cover the lid with these red hot coals and it sort of slow cooks to tender perfection. That's a, a really beautiful treat that you should try to look for when you're in Croatia called peka. And then I'm talking about this broadly. This is sort of for all of Croatia, Slovenia, and Bosnia. But one of the real joys of traveling here is that each region, each even city sometimes has their own specialties. And this is a dish. I want Tina, Tina to tell us more about this. This is an absolutely delicious Slovenian dish called štrukli. Tell us what a, a little bit about štrukli, Tina. Yeah, so štrukli is a dish that can come as a separate dish. It can come in a combination um, with the sausage, but it can also come in a combination as a dessert. Um, it depends just about what kind of a filling it has. It's a rolled dough, and then they have different fillings inside. The most common one is with cottage cheese. And then um, the one that you see on the picture, the one on the top is actually filled with cottage cheese and tarragon that can go both ways, either for savory or, or sweet. And then um, if you have a sweet version, most likely it will be filled either with walnuts or poppy seeds. Um, the, the thing, the brownish thing on top are breadcrumbs that are usually made and just done on butter. Um, and this is something that you can find in very traditional restaurants, but in also a little bit more upscale restaurants. It's something that's really coming back. And if you're traveling by yourself, you can already buy a pre paired ones already in the stores and you can just drop them into water and boil them and you can make your own feast if you would like to. But when traveling in this part of the world, you have to know that you can go from very traditional, very, um, I would say low key restaurants where you will eat very, very good to very high end, high quality restaurants. Um, in the recent years, both Croatia and Slovenia have been um, have found themselves as two big gastronomic destinations. Both countries have um, 10 Michelin star restaurants. Um, every year they add a few more to that list because the restaurants that are great are just opening up behind every corner. And if you are very um, smart, you can travel around the times when we have either open kitchens where this Michelin star chefs are cooking outside on the open fairs, or you can find months uh, where you have the week of restaurant or the month of restaurants uh, where the menus by Michelin star chef would be very, very um, cheap. Um, other than that, you'll just pay a similar amount of money for this ex exquisite cuisine as anywhere else in Western Europe. And I think Cameron, um, a lot of people when they travel to this part of the world sometimes think that things will be relatively cheap over here. Um, but unfortunately, we are a part of Europe. We all have euros, including Croatia, and prices have skyrocketed um, in the recent years. But you get a very good quality. Um, and, you know, sometimes the food is so beautiful that you don't even want to um, eat it because it looks so good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, and I think that's a really important point. Um, both the high, high quality that you can find here, but also the high prices. Um, and I think that's that's something that really struck me. I was just, like I said, back in Croatia, back in October, updating my guidebook for the first time. We, we couldn't update it during COVID. So it had been about three years. And even in those three years, I was kind of shocked at how high the prices had gotten. And I think Croatia 10, 15 years ago had a reputation as being a budget destination. That is a false expectation. I would not expect Croatia to be a budget destination, even when you eat at kind of a mid-range restaurant. Now, the good news is there's lots of beautiful places to eat. This is the seawall in Korčula. There's lots of great choices for restaurants. You're paying partly for this amazing view. It's still a pretty good value, but it's not like, you know, you can get two people can get a really fancy dinner for, for $10 or $20, like maybe was the case several years ago. Um, so I would just say calibrate your expectations if you're budgeting for a trip to Croatia and Slovenia. Bosnia is very cheap. I would say if you're going to Bosnia Herzegovina, that's an excellent budget destination. But Slovenia and especially Croatia, the prices are getting very high these days. And as Tina mentioned, it's been 20 days now that Croatia has the euro. They've phased out their traditional kuna currency. They adopted the euro currency back on January 1st. That's good news for the simplicity for travelers because you don't have to worry about changing money or figuring out the new exchange rate when you cross that border. However, it also means prices are even that much higher because a lot of businesses took the chance when they were you know, changing the prices into euros, they kind of padded those prices. And there's, there's a lot of concern in Croatia about the fact that this is just gonna make prices higher still. 
Yeah, true, true. A anyway, um, when when you will travel and just expect that, um, Croatia is much pricier than Slovenia, actually, um, in this respect right now. Um, even the basic stuff, going shopping into the grocery store, um, the prices are significantly different. And I have a very good um, person to tell me all about that because my sister, whenever we go and visit her in Croatia, she always gives us a full list of groceries, what we need to uh, bring her. And for example, just a plain one liter of milk is 50 cents more expensive in Croatia than it is in Slovenia. Um, wow. Yeah, and I don't think the prices will go down anytime soon. Um, it's also a destination which is very hard to reach. A lot of these islands that um, need delivery, of course, use other means of transportation to get the goods to their place. Um, so in one way, it's also understandable because it's very hard to access um, and too many means of transportation are being used for the transportation of those goods. Um, but of course, um, also tourism sometimes rises up the prices um, and especially when you come to the coastal city of Korčula um, it's a cruise ship destination for a day visit as well and those people also rise up the prices and bring the prices up yeah definitely it's it's really striking that trend the last few years and I imagine yeah. there's, no, there's no one in sight yeah and one other thing that I would like to say especially for those um, who are traveling individually uh, when you're going to these places be sure that you also make reservations ahead of time you know there's a lot of good um recommendations in the book in the rick steve's book um and i would definitely make reservations especially if i'm traveling to a lot of these places like dubrovnik split uh Korchula on a weekend because it's sometimes then hard to get the table if you don't have a reservation um even a week ahead yeah that's great advice i found the same thing when i was traveling there recently um it used to be at a lot of places you could just kind of stroll up but it's it's popular. There's a lot of people that are competing with you for those restaurant tables. So, well, we've now uh, reached our final stop in Croatia. We're going to head on to a couple other countries in a moment. But, you know, we've kind of saved the best for last here in Croatia. There's a lot to love in Croatia. I would say for my money, if you had to pick one place to go to in Croatia, it would be hard to make a case for any place other than Dubrovnik. This is the city of Dubrovnik. This is the last stop on our Adriatic tour. And it's just, I've never met anyone who's been here who didn't fall in love with it, except it can be crowded with those cruises that Tina was, was talking about. So that's the one thing that can kind of can kind of hamper the enjoyment. But Tina's going to give us a couple tips later for how to avoid those crowds. In any event, Dubrovnik is a beautiful, beautiful old town. It's called the Pearl of the Adriatic for the way that its walled old town kind of sticks out into the sea. And, you know, we've been sharing you pictures of all these beautiful smaller towns in Croatia, Rovin and, and uh, Korčula, for example, and Hvar. Well, Dubrovnik is kind of like the best of all of those, except it's on a much bigger scale. It's just a huge, beautiful city, and it's just so much fun to explore and wander around. I find it's got some of the most inviting public spaces and just about anywhere you can go. And it's got this gorgeous main drag called the Stradun, which is, you know, it's it's got this pavement that's been polished to a high shine. So it's like you're walking across polished marble, and it's just a delight to walk up and down the street when you're in town. Beautiful squares, and it's it's a very nice place. I will say it is very crowded. And so there's a lot of ways to avoid those crowds. One thing is there's lots of little uh, nooks and crannies tucked off to the side. There's some beautiful cloisters. There's courtyards. There's ways to kind of get away from all the crowds, especially in the middle of the day. Tina, what would you suggest for how people can enjoy Dubrovnik without being kind of annoyed by the crowds? Yeah, I would say starting as early as possible and going later in the evening as well, because the cruise shippers mostly arrive between 1030 and they stay in the, in the town up until six. So in those times between 1030 and six, I would venture out, um, eat my niece because it's very steep, uh, to go as far away from that main drag called Stradun, maybe go visit some of the museums. Um, Dubrovnik doesn't have a lot of museums, but some of them are very cute, very little, tiny, um, and they give you a good um, hideaway from all the crowds that stay mostly just on the main drag. Um, if you would like to walk the wall, just start as early as possible, or let's say about an hour and a half before uh, closing off the wall. This will eliminate the crowds. Um, you can also do just part of the wall, and that way you can uh, start in the upper section and you don't need to walk up the hill so much and you have all the best views and you avoid the entry place where the cruise shippers come in. Um, so there's numerous ways. Plus there are a lot of activities that are offered just outside of the city walls by local people um, that are extremely uh, cool um, and 
there's a lot of that just need to browse a little bit through it and there's a lot of good recommendations inside of the book as well but definitely you can find Alice like that in the middle of the day when on Stradun you have um, 6,000 people jamming in and you can be all by yourself uh, just you know two minutes walk away from that main drag yeah, I think that's spot on, Tina. You're right. I've I've been on the that main street when it's so crowded, you can't even walk down the street. And it's incredible to me. You just walk less than <laughs> yeah. two minutes. You just walk straight uphill on some of these stone stairs, and suddenly you've got the place entirely to yourself. And I think the early and late is another good tip. So for example, there's a you, you might think this is just a tourist town, but there's actually local people who live here. And there's a really fun produce market early in the morning on a market square right in the heart of town. Um, so it's 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 worth getting up early to kind of browse with the locals there. And as Tina was mentioning, if there's there's one great act, there's a lot of great activities in Dubrovnik, but the top activity probably is walking around the top of that town wall. I've shown you a couple of pictures of the walled town, and it's really cool. You can actually go all the way around the entire perimeter of the town on the top of the wall. It's just an absolutely breathtaking activity. And every step of the way, you have beautiful views, amazing views. You've got a sea of red rooftops on one side, and you've got the actual sea on the other side. And it's just a magical, magical place uh, to, to be. And for our tour, it's a great way to finish off our Adriatic tour. I think people are, are just blown away by this. And don't forget, you're on vacation. And like Tina said, there's some great stuff just outside of those town walls. You see the old town of Dubrovnik there at the top of the picture. Five, 10 minute walk away, you've got incredible beaches where you can just relax and enjoy. So in fact, for people who are doing our Adriatic tour, it's we suggest it's not a bad thing if you've got the time to spare. Spend a couple of extra days in Dubrovnik at the end. You'll never run out of things to do. There's lots of great day trips. I wanted to mention one day trip. It's not included on the tour, but it's a good piece of advice if you're taking the tour or if you're going on your own from Dubrovnik. One of the most satisfying day trips, if you have a day to spare, is to drive south. And in about an hour and a half, you reach the border of the country of Montenegro. And if you get about another hour or so beyond the border, you go around this stunning natural bay, natural kind of fjord-like bay called the Bay of Kotor. And you end up in the beautiful town of Kotor. And it's a it's a long day from Dubrovnik and you want to get an early start, as with everything, to avoid crowds at the border. But this is a really satisfying and fun and beautiful day trip from Dubrovnik, one that's very popular. Now, I mentioned Montenegro is a different country from Croatia, but that was not the case, uh, what, 30 years ago. In fact, Tina was born in Slovenia, but she wasn't born in Slovenia. She was born in Yugoslavia. And I think a really interesting component of the of visiting this region, again, whether you're on a tour or on your own, is you get to finally kind of understand what is this Yugoslavia? I think for a lot of us Americans, there's an air of mystery to it. It's this big country that existed once and doesn't anymore. And so I I really am excited for Tina to tell us a little bit about Yugoslavia and what it was like to grow up in Yugoslavia. So tell us, tell us about Yugoslavia, Tina. Yeah, so it's probably really kind of funny that I come from a country that doesn't does no longer exist where well, I was actually born into a country that doesn't exist anymore. But what I would say about it is that it's, it was extremely beautiful. It was varied um, from high mountains to beautiful coast, um, to incredible nature, to flatlands and very fertile fields. And at its end, it actually had 23 million inhabitants and all of them had a different idea how Yugoslavia should be run. Um, if you look at the map, you can see that it has six republics. Actually, we believe that there were five languages, only that there were three official languages that were spoken in Yugoslavia. There were three religions and two alphabets that we have used, the Latin and the Cyrillic. Um, and a lot of people, every time when they say Yugoslavia, first of all, they are not aware that the name has been made up because Yugo means South. Yugoslavia, the land of Southern Slavs. And that's how the name was created. It was given to this part of the world after World War I, but then it stuck also when it was established again after the Second World War, this time as a Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia on the 29th of November, 1943. Um, actually, a lot of people refer to this part of the world as communist. But I would say we had a very different kind of communism. Ours was more a communism with a human face because um, there was no such thing as Iron Curtain in our part of the world. Uh, people could own land in this part of the world to a certain size. Um, people could own their own small private businesses. Um, and what was most important, we could all travel. Um, I have one really cool thing here with me and that's my first passport that I ever had. 
Uh, this is actually Yugoslav passport. You can see the coat of arms of Yugoslavia, and you can also see the two um, alphabets. And this passport actually brought us everywhere because of our leader's politics. So Tito was our leader back in the day. He was uh, considered a dictator, but more a benevolent dictator. He opened up the borders of Yugoslavia, not just to us, to go travel, but also to other people to come visit Yugoslavia. And back in the 70s and 80s, this was one of the most popular destinations. And believe it or not, with this passport, we could travel without a visa and without major problems into Russia, Cuba, or United States. And that was one of the rare passports. People were killing for these passports, literally. So yeah, and you know, I have a lot of fond memories from when I was growing up, but probably one of the fondest memories was that when we were seven years old, uh, we were actually accepted to this little pioneer squad. So everybody said, okay, you will now get, you know, you're now a proper adult. I still have the head, the original one. It, it seems to be, see, yeah. <laughs> it seems to be just a little bit too too small right now. I think my head was a little. And then I had a little scarf over here. Usually the scarf would be put around our, yeah, like this. And then we would be given a little, little um, tiny cards. Um, and there was a whole ceremony. You know, it was like a way to adulthood. Um, and we were so proud of this. When I was seven years old, when I was accepted to that, um, actually, I wore this hat and a scarf pretty <laughs> much all the time. My mom had to convince me to take it off. And, you know, it was just a very proud moment to be a pioneer, to be, um, to be something, you know, that you represented. And there's even words of, of Tito that were very high for the pioneers who were seven years old, you know, like be a generation which will continue the famous tradition of our country, which will have the best qualities through which our nations have um, walked through history. So words like this that we were reading when we were little. But of course, Tito, as all, um, also had his faults, mm -hmm. even though sometimes people get a little nostalgic about Yugoslavia. Um, Tito also had his faults as well, and some of his decisions unfortunately led to the collapse of Yugoslavia in the early 90s, and we all know how that ended. Um, it ended up with a war that was going on from 1991 up until 1995, and unfortunately I must say that still even 30 years after the war has ended, um, so it ended in 1995, people still stigmatize our area with the war. And a lot of local people are a little bit um, sick of it already, to tell you the truth, because, um, you know, it has truly marked up our lives. It has marked up our territories. And I think a lot of locals just want to move on. We want to talk about rich history of our region, beautiful gastronomy, beautiful nature, beautiful sites. And yes, of course, war is a part of our history that we will always mention, but we don't want to be considered as the place where war still goes on because it definitely has stopped 30 years ago. And I think this is what we also want to tell everybody that that is visiting our part of the world. Well, I think that's that's really well said. That's beautiful, Tina. And I, I think that's what, what I'm thinking about listening to you talk here is imagine the privilege it is for an American to get on a tour bus with you and get to spend a couple of weeks with you hearing your personal stories and recollections of you were growing up in Yugoslavia and having someone take them by the hand and help them understand what Yugoslavia was and how it came together and how it broke apart. And I think you're right. I, I, I travel a lot in this region and it's it's easy to get fixated on the Yugoslav wars because maybe we remember back in the 1990s, we saw that on the news a lot. And But what you said is perfect. It's a piece of the story, a piece of the history, but it's that's only that, just a small piece. And it's actually pretty distant at this point. It's pretty far in the past. So I think a, a major feature of traveling here, whether you're on, the, on your own or whether you're taking a tour, is learning about that recent history, fairly recent history, um, getting a little context for the things you remember about, about that time. And also going beyond kind of the idea that Yugoslavia is associated with wars and these, these countries that came out of Yugoslavia are, are somehow associated with wars and realize how beautiful and how different 
and how rich each of them is in terms of their culture and their gastronomy and all the things you're you're speaking about. So, wow, thank you for sharing that. That's that's amazing. No problem. Yeah. And now speaking of the former Yugoslavia, um, yet another country that used to be part of this one big country. And I think the other thing I think that really resonated with what you said, Tina, when you think about everything, every single picture you're seeing tonight, all used to be one. Now it's four countries, including Montenegro, used to be one country, Yugoslavia. I mean, it, the incredible variety in this in this country. Now you have to cross a border to get to Bosnia Herzegovina. But when you go there, it's just an incredible spot. And so I'm going to talk very briefly about Bosnia Herzegovina, which is a very easy day trip cutting across uh, from the Dalmatian coast. And here you're going to find a lot of Muslim culture because there's a, a large contingent of the population in Bosnia are practicing Muslims. And it just it makes it very different culturally. It feels more like you're a little closer to Turkey based, based on this historic Ottoman influence. So, for example, people will get together. Tina was talking in Split about people who would sit out on the Riva and enjoy a little cup of espresso. Well, here in Bosnia, they have unfiltered Bosnian coffee. It might be what you'd call Turkish coffee, but they call it Bosnian coffee. This is also a great opportunity for people who maybe haven't spent a lot of time in Muslim cultures. Here you're two hours, three hours away from the beaches in Dubrovnik, and you can actually step into a mosque and learn about Islam from a practicing Muslim. Um, so this is a place that's really rewarding to visit, very easy to visit from the Dalmatian coast. The other thing I associate with Bosnia is stunning natural scenery. Again, like the rest of this whole region, it's just beautiful. The city of Mostar that you see here basically fills this gorgeous natural gorge. And spanning that gorge, spanning the Neretva River in the middle of Mostar, is this remarkable old bridge. This is literally built by the Ottoman uh, Sultan. Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent built this bridge. And it's a symbol of Mostar. Unfortunately, if you've heard about this bridge, it might be because back during those Yugoslav wars, it was badly damaged and eventually destroyed in that fighting. But I think the important thing here is, as Tina said, when you go to a place like Mostar, obviously we're going to learn about the war as one chapter in the history, but realize that that's just the one chapter in the history. And now they've rebuilt the bridge and they've resumed this beautiful tradition in Mostar where young men stand at the top of the bridge. You see the guy with his arms stretched out. And they dive off of the bridge into that icy cold river below. Uh, and it's a really fun custom that kind of is a celebration of the of the city of Mostar and of Bosnian culture. Um, so I just love to spend time in Bosnia. It's so easy to get to from the Dalmatian coast. I kind of think of it as Bosnia with training wheels because it's a very easy and accessible place to get a taste of Bosnia. If you have a little bit more time and want to delve deeper into the culture, I would suggest, this is not on any of our tours, but I love the city of Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's about a two and a half hour bus or train ride or drive farther from Mostar. You're going deeper into Bosnia. But, you know, I'll, I'll go on and on about Sarajevo if you let me. But just trust me, if you have a little extra time in this region, it's really worth spending a little time in Sarajevo as well. Really a, an amazing place. Okay, now we have reached, finally, Tina's home country and... I've got to admit, this is, uh, if people ask me, what's my favorite country? I try not to play favorites, but uh, this is a pretty easy answer for me. I adore Slovenia as well. So I want to tell you a little bit, we're going to tell you a little bit about what's so beautiful and great about Slovenia. And I'll just start by saying, just on a superficial level as a traveler, it's, first of all, the, the thing I associate with Slovenia are mountains. It's a beautiful alpine country. It's just stunning mountain vistas, I think. If you didn't know better when you opened your eyes, you might think you were in Switzerland or Austria. Well, actually, Austria is just over the border. Slovenia touches the Austrian Alps and the Italian Alps in this little corner of Europe. And it has that beautiful Alpine majesty. And, and because it touches Austria and Italy, the other thing I really love about Slovenia, it has wonderful people, as you're learning tonight with Tina. She's very representative of the wonderful people in, in uh, Slovenia. And something about Slovenia that I think helps inform that is it's this sort of at an intersection of cultures. It's the northernmost corner of the former Yugoslavia. So you have this strong Slavic culture, but it's also touching Austria. So you have sort of some Germanic orderliness. And it's also touching Italy. So it, it, there's sort of a joy of life and kind of a loose, breezy culture. And I like to say it's it sort of feels like Slovenia has sort of chosen the best bits of each of those cultures and they've woven it into something unique and very beautiful. And there's lots of, one thing I love about Slovenia is Slovenes are very proud and there's some really, uh, important cultural icons that Slovenes are very excited about. And I want Tina to tell us about a couple of them. And they're things that might be surprising when you think about big, mighty countries and the things they're proud of. I think the things Slovenes are proud of are really telling and also very, very beautiful and very endearing. 
One of them is a hay rack and the other is the bee. So Tina, tell us about the hay racks and the bees. Yeah, so hay racks are actually our national characteristics. You can find them on every single field because we are a mountainous country. So during the summer months, there's a lot of thunderstorms, you know, in the middle of a blue skies and a sunny day, we can just have a very abrupt break in a big thunderstorm. So when the farmers were cutting the hay, the hay could never dry. And that's, of course, not good for the hay if you are using it for the animals. Um, so already back in the 1700s, they started creating these wooden structures uh, that were actually helping the farmers dry the hay. And it's a work for the whole family uh, to put the hay once it's cut on the racks, and then it's a very beautiful feature. They're even protected by law as technical heritage monuments. Um, and actually every single farmer that maintains one and has one uh, gets a little bit of a subsidy from the government, which I think uh, keeps this tradition really alive. Um, and when you come with me on a tour, I can go into details about um, what animals will eat, what grass, but you know, that's maybe um, for another <laughs> session. <laughs> And what about speaking of animals, yeah. what about the what about the bees? Yeah, for us, bee is the queen of all animals. Um, I think Slovenians, we just have a very huge appreciation of our bees. We understand how important bees are for our livelihood. And we even have a little slogan saying that to be a Slovenian is actually to be a beekeeper. Uh, there's about five beekeepers for every inhabitant of Slovenia. So in total, over 11,000 beekeepers in the country. Um, and they all work with the beautiful um, bee called Carniolian Gray. This is the indigenous species that lives in our country. Um, actually very, very mild, very hardworking. Uh, we always like to say just like the people. Um, and what is interesting is that a lot of us do believe in the healing, um, healing modes from whatever the bees do, from pollen to honey. A lot of us don't even use sugar. We use honey instead. And about 80% of our honey is actually um, bought directly by the beekeepers themselves. They don't even arrive to the shelves. That's how much we appreciate our honey. Uh, we also like to decorate our hives. Um, as you can see, they have a lot of colors, but they also have motifs. Um, and some of the motifs uh, we call the beehive panels. Um, the painted beehive panels have been introduced in our country in the 1800s. And it's just a local folk art. Um, at first, those beehive panels were actually... I have a, I have a few uh, samples here. Yeah, Cameron here. has a few samples. While you're, of while you're discussing, I'll just... Beehive sure. panels. And actually, a lot of these beehive panels um, have taken first the motifs of saints. Uh, later on, it was the motifs from everyday life. The one that Cameron is showing now was usually a gift for weddings. Then there is the bear wedding uh, that we see. Um, and I think, Cameron, maybe you can show the most classic one. Uh, this is when two farmers are fighting for a cow and the guy underneath, if you put it just a little bit higher, um, is milking a cow and that's, you know, the lawyer. Um, it could work really well in America, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But as, as you can see, I've been charmed yeah. by this. And every time I go to Slovenia, yeah. I bring them a new beehive panel. So I've got, I've got now about yeah. 20 or 25 of the beehive and, panels. And if you think of it, this has been in the past the color television of our countryside because people didn't have access to the news. Um, you either went to the church and read things from the frescoes, or you could also go to the local beekeeper and see in which saints they believed, in what kind of um, relationship husband and wife had, and what kind of political situation was going on in the country. They even painted some animals that they have heard of, like the first arrival of elephants and lions. Um, and that's all been marked on the beehive panels as well, because we don't have elephants and lions living in Slovenia, <laughs> except in the zoo. Um, but yeah, it's that's a wonderful, wonderful, yeah. wonderful thing. Yeah, yeah, I love these. I love these little cultural details. And Slovenia is just it's so full of them. Well, let's I want to tell people about a few of the places they can go in Slovenia. The capital city, Ljubljana. I mean, I think it's just a wonderful small capital city. I think it's like a quarter of a million people very mellow for a capital. People compare it to Salzburg sometimes because you've got a castle on a uh, on a mountain in the middle of town and there's a river and a beautiful old town underneath. It's also got some really beautiful architecture. And there's a very famous architect who really left his mark on Ljubljana, like no one I can imagine leaving a mark on any other place. And that is this wonderful man named Joža Plechnik. He's the guy that earlier, remember, he's on my, my tea mug here. And I want Tina to tell us what is so significant and important about Joža Plechnik. 
Yeah, Jozef Plechnik was a local man coming from Ljubljana. Then later on, he went and studied in Vienna. Um, then he was chosen as the architect to um, rebuild the castle in Prague. And then finally, he returned back home um, after the earthquake of 1895. He single-handedly uh, changed the landscape of our city. Uh, he did a lot of motor and urban design. He's compared a lot with Antonio Gaudí in Spain with what a mark he has left on the architecture of the city. And his architecture is very unique. He has a very distinctive style, lots of symbolism in his architecture. And we are very proud to say that in 2021, his work has been inscribed into the UNESCO World Heritage Site as um, the way of how you can design an urban scape in a city. Um, so a remarkable man, and we are all very, very proud of him. And I think he's a great example. When you travel to these countries, there's a lot of names that are very important locally that as Americans, we probably haven't been exposed to very much. And I, I, I bet if you pulled people on the street in the US, who's Joža Plechnik? Almost nobody could tell you who he is. But if you are in Ljubljana for a few hours, you come to appreciate, wow, this guy was an absolute genius yeah. and he completely transformed his city. And it's and it's a beautiful thing to learn about him. And what was great about him was also that he actually built for the people. You know, he didn't build just things to be there, to look at them, to observe them, but to people actually be using them. Um, and that is how, you know, it's just incorporating into every vein of the city. Uh, he's just so incorporated inside. And he also has a marvelous museum. Um, you can visit his birdhouse when you're in Ljubljana and it's splendid. So definitely a worthwhile experience. Yes, I think that's a great tip. There's a, a great museum for him. Um, to say a little bit more about Ljubljana, it's got also just this wonderful cafe culture. It's it's a great place just to sit out and watch the world go by at these beautiful riverfront cafes. It's also just an incredibly pedestrian friendly city. They've closed down a lot of the city center so people like you and I can just go out and stroll for basically blocks and blocks throughout the city center and never have to worry about seeing a car. I mean, I think Tina, you and I have talked about this a lot. We just uh -huh. we just can't get enough of this place it's just for to relax and spend time in it. It's, it's just purely enjoyable. Yeah, and if you're ever in Ljubljana um, on a weekend between end of March and end of October, if you have good weather, you might stumble upon this amazing market called the Open Kitchen. Um, actually, where you see the stalls, that is where restaurants of the city, sometimes also from out of the city, are coming down uh, to offer food for a fraction of the price that they have in their restaurants. And you can see some Michelin star chef cooking over there. Um, and you can just mingle with the locals. The locals just incorporated this event into their lives. Um, and it's buzzing with people and it's just a remarkable thing. Uh, the only time when this is off, it's in the winter and when the weather is bad. So plan on being in Ljubljana on a Friday for sure. That's a great tip. Yeah, it's called the open kitchen. And when I make my itinerary to go to Europe, uh, to this part of Europe, I always look and make sure that if I'm in Ljubljana, I'm there on a Friday because this is such a, a wonderful event. Um, we're going to go out into the countryside of Slovenia and we're going to go to what's probably, I mean, Ljubljana is a wonderful city, but what we're about to see, see here is probably the most famous and the best thing that you're going to see in all of Slovenia. And I'm not just saying that because uh, Tina lives about 10 minutes away from here. Uh, this is the famous Lake Bled, a beautiful mountain resort with a castle perched on a cliff overlooking this beautiful lake takes about an hour and a half to walk all the way around the lake, and I highly recommend it. That's a, a great thing to do. And then right in the middle of the lake is this beautiful little island that's capped with a church, and you ride out on a special local boat to get to the island. And I want Tina to talk us through what it's like to go out to the island in the middle of Lake Bled. Yeah, so you can take these boats. Those are the traditional Pletna boats that have been on the lake since the mid-18, basically mid-1800s. Um, and actually, it's a family tradition that's passed on from father to the son. Um, usually, those boats bring you all the way to the island. You can also row yourself, but not those boats, other boats. And then the only other challenge that you have to do is the 99 stairs that lead to the top of the Church of the Assumption. And if you're feeling, oh my God, I don't want to walk those 99 stairs. Well, if you're getting married, then it's when you really have a problem because the future groom needs to take the future bride up those stairs. Doesn't matter what way, piggyback is okay as well. Um, and we believe that if they survive the carrying of the stairs, they will survive everything in marriage as well. If not, you better run away when it's still time. And it's a big local tradition. Um, there's a lot of people that get married in Lake Blade. It's a popular wedding destination. Um, 
So you see this quite a lot. And there is a very good ratio of people being successful. I think we are at 98%, which tells you that the people of Slovenia are just very stubborn and sturdy. But I think it's maybe also because of the area where we live in. We live in the mountains and that's what gives us the sturdiness. That's great. Well, Lake Blade gives us a beautiful glance at the mountains, but if you want to go a little bit deeper into the mountains, we're going to finish up our talk about Slovenia by going on what for me is, I think, the best possible day trip you can do in this part of Europe. And that is uh, this beautiful twisty mountain road up and over a pass, a mountain pass that's called the Vršić Pass. Basically, it's 50 switchbacks. You go up and over the Vršić Pass and you have these stunning views the whole way. And then you come down the other side of the Vršić Pass, and now you're deep in the region called the Julian Alps. The Julian Alps is the name for the part of the Alps that's here in Slovenia. And you're driving along a river called the Socha River. It's just an absolutely stunningly beautiful mountain drive. It's fantastic. There's also some really interesting history here. And as you're going up along the Vršić Pass, for example, you pull over and here's this, this Russian chapel in the middle of nowhere. And Tina wants to tell us a little bit about, I think, uh, the history that the, the, the created this pass and that, that people might associate with this valley. Yeah, again, we do have some very interesting historical sites and what a lot of our guests um, say that they never expected to see anything like it. Um, this part of the world has been, um, how would you say, an observer of the World War I battles. Um, actually, the highest mountain battles ever fought in history of humankind have been fought on this terrain. And that is due to the position because we were lying in the Alps at the end of the Alps, which were the lowest. Um, and this was a very important mountain passage back in the day, which was also the border between the Kingdom of Italy and the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Um, so these battlefields are not as well known, um, but if you um, mention two names, um, Ernest uh, Erwin Rommel and Ernest Hemingway, those are actually the two men that fought on World War I battles. Um, Ernest Hemingway actually even wrote a book about it called The Farewell to Arms. Um, and it's just stunning because just out in this beautiful countryside, you can see some remnants from the war. You can see some trenches, you can see some memorials. The Russian chapel that Cameron just showed before is actually dedicated to the uh, Russian prisoners that have been um, captured in this area back in the day. This mausoleum is dedicated to the Italian soldiers that lost their lives um, uh, in the battalions of World War I. Actually, in the city of Kobarit, which is called Caporetto, they have found themselves in the biggest trouble. And still in Italian language, whenever Italians are in trouble, they say Caporetto and use the name of our city, which I think it's a phenomenal thing. And of course, we also have cemeteries that are spread around. There was so many nations that were fighting over here. This is actually a cemetery dedicated to the Austro-Hungarian soldiers fallen in this area. So besides the beautiful nature, we also have a little bit of history that it's worth talking about and a lot of very cute and very interesting and very eye-opening museums uh, run by very um, smart individuals that are actually also contributing a lot to the understanding of World War I in our part of the world. Yeah, and I think this historical dimension, it adds a whole new dimension to what is otherwise just a beautiful drive. And if it weren't for all the World War I history, that would be enough because this is a stunningly beautiful area. But then you have this sort of added component of learning about this fascinating high mountain warfare that took place 100 years ago. But honestly, you could even ignore all of that and just have a spectacular drive through the Socha River Valley. And you pull over and you look down and there's these incredible gorges with water that's both sort of perfectly clear and strangely colorful at the same time. I mean, it's really incredible waterfalls and gorges. And there's all these springy suspension bridges. So you can pull over on the side of the road and go out on a bridge and kind of bounce up and down over these gorges. Um, and there's also lots of kayakers. I mean, people just love spending time here. I want to mention that we actually love this place so much that on this Adriatic tour that we've been talking about, we spend a night here high in the mountains in this town of Bovets. And Tina, before we leave Slovenia and leave the Julian Alps, do you have any, any final thoughts about this beautiful mountainous part of your country? Yeah, I would say that during COVID days, actually, Slovenians have rediscovered our mountains. So um, even though we love hiking and we love going around um, now even more than ever, 
Um, so if you're doing any of the drives across the Julian Alps, be sure you're not planning it on the weekends. So Saturday and Sundays can be pretty tight. Uh, there's a lot of people out there, especially on a good day. And then do not plan on going there July and August, uh, because this is when it gets really, really crowded. Uh, sometimes Vershich Pass is so packed that it's hard to even drive across. But in the off season, in the other months, especially let's say in the fall, fall is my favorite time when the leaves are changing. It's a paradise on earth. It's so wonderful and beautiful. I've said this to you before, but I'll say it in front of everybody. You're incredibly fortunate to live in such a, a stunningly, I keep saying the word stunning, a just a breathtakingly beautiful part of the world. You're very lucky. So Yeah, we, we are very fortunate because Slovenia is really a gem. And, you know, more and more people are discovering it. But a lot of people, every time when, when people come to Slovenia, one of the first questions that they always say is, how come I didn't know about this place before? Yeah, you absolutely. Know. I I feel the same way. People, when I tell people it's my favorite country, there's a lot of people are like, huh, Slovenia? You mean Slovakia? No, I don't mean Slovakia. I mean Slovenia. <laughs> and then once, I will say, once people have been there, I don't think I've ever met anybody who's ever been to Slovenia who didn't yeah. say to me, I'm so glad I went, two things. I'm so glad I went there. I almost didn't. And I'm glad that I figured out it was worth going to. And the other thing that I say is I wish I had more time because a lot of people try to rush through yeah. in a day yeah. or two. And you can see a lot and have a very satisfying visit in a day or two, but you know you you wouldn't regret having a little extra time or a lot of extra time, I think. So um, I want to run through uh, these itineraries that we cover on this. Now, Tina and I are going to be answering your questions very soon. So please sit tight because in just a few minutes, we're going to be uh, going through all the questions that we've been collecting through the course of our, our session here. But I wanted to run through first the two itineraries we have on our Rick Steves tours that cover these places. And the first one is the one that catches almost every little last thing, except for Sarajevo and Montenegro. Everything you've seen so far today is covered on this one tour. It's our best of the Adriatic in 14-day tours. And actually, Tina, you, of course, you and I remember this, but you and I helped sort of create this years ago because we did the Eastern Europe tour, which I'm about to show you, and gave people a taste of these countries. And everyone was like, ah, I wish we had more time in Croatia and Slovenia. So we gave it to them. And what we're doing here is we start in the capital city of Ljubljana for a couple nights. We get a nice look at Lake Bled for a few hours for people who want to take a look at Lake Bled. We drive up and over the Vršić Pass into the Socha Valley and have a beautiful night high in the Julian Alps. Then we head across the border into Croatia. We start in Istria, which you might recall is where we started our presentation. We stay in a hill town in the interior, but we go out to that beautiful coastal town of Rovin and the Roman ruins of Pula. From there, we go to Plitvice Lakes National Park in the interior of Croatia. And the last week or so is along the Dalmatian coast. We go to the big city of Split, the small island of Korčula, and of course, spectacular Dubrovnik. And in the middle there, we take a little detour into Bosnia-Herzegovina to give you a look at Mostar. Now I'm talking about this in terms of our tour, but if someone asked me as the person who wrote uh, the Rick Steves guidebook on Croatia, what's the best two weeks to spend in Croatia and Slovenia? I think it would be basically exactly the same, whether you're on your own or on a tour. If you want to just get a little taste of Croatia and a little taste of some other places in the region, we've got our best of Eastern Europe, Europe in 15 days tour. And this is kind of the survey tour. This is the grand tour. It's the sampler platter, right? So first of all, we spend a couple of nights each actually three nights and a couple of them, of the three great cities of Central Europe. So first we go to Prague, and then we go to Budapest, and then we go to Krakow in Poland. So you get those three great Central European cities. And then from there we head south, and then we hit the waterfalls at Plitvica, which we saw earlier, the beautiful coastal town of Rovin. We spend two whole nights there. It's a great chance to take a vacation from your vacation. And we finish up in Tina's backyard at Lake Bled. This is a great tour if you just kind of want the once over lightly, seeing all of these places. Now, before we get to the Q&A, we have a little bit of special bonus content. This is sounds a little bit random, but actually it makes a lot of sense. We're going to take you for a few minutes to Bulgaria, Bulgaria of all places, which is really just to the east of these countries. It's adjoining the former Yugoslavia over to the east. Now, the reason we're going to talk about this is we have a wonderful tour guide from Bulgaria named Stefan who runs our program there. And we haven't really found a good slot for him elsewhere in our Festival of Europe. And we thought, you know what, Tina and I love Stefan and we love Bulgaria. So we thought we would let Rick as a special guest host and Stefan tell you about five minutes about Bulgaria as sort of a curveball. And as soon as we're done showing you this video clip here in just a moment, Tina and I will be back with Lisa and we will answer all of your questions that you've been sending in this entire evening. So if you'll 
Give me a second. I'm going to give you a chance to hear about Bulgaria on behalf of Rick and our guide, Stefan. Here we go. I am so thankful to be able to welcome to our little travel festival my friend and fellow tour guide from Sofia in Bulgaria, Stefan Bozajel. Stefan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your invitation, Rick. It's so great to be with you. How many years have you been doing tours with Rick Steves Europe now? Oh, it's been only nine years with you. Nine years, and we've got a lot of years ahead. Well, I just want to quickly welcome you and remind our viewers that we've got a wonderful Best of Bulgarian 12 Days tour. You can see it right here. And I'm going to just uh, remind people that when we have you as our guide, we have a man who really in your country is like the ambassador to Americans enjoying your country. Here, you and I are having dinner with the ambassador to uh, Bulgaria from the United States, Eric Rubin. And I know Eric uses you a lot when we've got important guests and so on. And as far as I'm concerned, all of our Rick Steves tours are important guests as you introduce us to your beautiful country. Uh, Stefan, I have put together just a few slides. I'd love it if you could just talk us through that so we get a little taste of what you'd have to offer when we tour Bulgaria on a Rick Steves Europe tour. Oh, absolutely. So we're starting with uh, Sofia, the bustling capital of uh, Bulgaria. And here we can see the uh, heart of the city. Of course, we have a number of communist remnants, most of them now kept in the museums and slowly getting away from the people's memory. But now their place is in the museums. But, 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 the, real, but the real memory is many centuries older than the communists. I totally agree, like what we see here, Rio Monastery, the spiritual heart of all Bulgarians. It is deep into the Rio Mountains, and it's a place where every single Bulgarian should visit at least once in their life. This is the spiritual heart and soul of the Bulgarian people. And then we go to Plovdiv. I love Plovdiv. Plovdiv is also my favorite city. It's full of life. It's a vibrant city. As you can see here, the main pedestrian drag of the city is the largest pedestrian only street in Europe. And to, at every single corner, you can see different slices of the different cultures and civilizations. It's, it's, a, it's a celebration of Bulgarian life. And literally, you dig down and you find what was there centuries and centuries before. But then we head out into the countryside, which is filled with surprises. It is, as you can see here, if you happen to be in Bulgaria in between mid-May and mid-June and you go into the very center of the of the country and you see the rose harvest, all those rose orchards, this is where the very famous Bulgarian rose oil is being made. The amazing. All around. It's amazing that roses are an industry in Bulgaria. We'll be driving through fields of roses, remembering that's part of the local economy. And then this beautiful town up in the north, we have historic, traditional artisans all around. Yes, like uh, here in our old medieval capital in Veliko Ternovo. The, here, it is my dear friend Tosko. He's a very good person and he's a master with silver filigree. And together with our groups, we have the chance to go around him and to see the very same technique that has been done 300 years ago. It's so fun in our travels to recognize slices of European culture that we may not have even appreciated. It can be the cuisine. This is the wonderful, wonderful Shopska salad, the, the Bulgarian main salad, and just the, the, the vitality in the streets when it comes to celebrating part of your culture. What's going on here? Absolutely. Here we are celebrating our alphabet. We are celebrating our letters. And here on May 24, the people are in the streets, the students are in the streets, and we are cel celebrating the Cyrillic. This is something really important at our most beloved <laughs> holiday in Bulgaria. The Cyrillic alphabet. I mean, I've never had a chance to have a parade celebrating our alphabet. I don't even know what we call it, actually. But you've got the Cyrillic alphabet, and you guys are embracing that. You're owning it. In fact, so many slices of your culture are vivid and on display for your visitors. What are we looking at here? We, we're looking at uh, very traditional Bulgarian folklore costumes. Our folklore music is alive. It is still around us. And we celebrate it every single day. And we have the opportunity with our guests 
to go into deep into that and to celebrate together, be part of it. So in 12 days, we've put together with Stefan's help, a marvelous tour. We start in Sofia, go up into the mountains to the Rila Monastery, over to Plovdiv, just that's where the people action is, through the countryside and the rose petals, down to the Black Sea coast, into the hills to Villa Katarnovo, where we see the artisans and finish off back where we started in Sofia. Stefan, I am so thankful to have somebody so passionate about your culture and so able to, with such enthusiasm and such creativity, share your culture. Thank you for being one of our guides, and I look forward to seeing you next time I'm in Bulgaria. Thank you for this opportunity, Rick. It's always a pleasure to have you here, and Blagodaria. Thank you. Blagodaria and Dobrden. Good day. Good day. Dobrden. That's great. Well, thank you so much to Rick and Stefan for preparing that very brief trip to Bulgaria. And I have to say, Stefan's a great guy. And I've uh, traveled with Rick and Stefan in Bulgaria making our TV show there a few years ago. And you wouldn't want anyone else but Stefan and his team showing you around this beautiful country. So I'm glad we got a chance to give them a little bit of, a, of the spotlight here during our Festival of Europe. Um, just a reminder, if you're interested in any of the tours we've talked about here, again, $100 off every seat on every Rick Steves tour through January 31st, but be sure to use that code FEST23. And thanks for joining us tonight on the Festival of Europe. Remember, we're only halfway through, so you've got a week and a half left of great content. Tomorrow night, it's Sicily with Rick and Tommaso, our guide from Sicily. And coming up next week, we've got Turkey, France, Ireland, Germany, the Netherlands, Greece, and so forth. And don't forget, this coming Monday is Ethical Travels in a Warming World, where our COO Craig is gonna tell us about the Rick Steves Climate Smart Commitment. And I think that's it from us. And I wanted to uh, thank Tina again for coming. And now is our chance. We're very excited to take your questions. Hello, thank you so much for that great information, Tina, for sharing your heartfelt stories. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions. I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna ask a few rapid fire questions. So these will not have long answers, but um, several people asked when you talked about coffee, can you get decaf? Yes. yes. Okay. Sandy wants to know, what's the tipping situation? Uh, rounding up. Um, I would say they they are trying to expect in big tourist city about 10%, but otherwise it's rounding up to the next full figure. Do not exaggerate because tipping is not obligatory. Okay. Um, and David wanted everyone to know, Cameron, your book is on sale on Kindle for $1.99. Mm-hmm. I personally could not verify that because I already own it on Kindle. So we'll have to take David's work for it. But does everybody know that Cameron has written a book with a wonderful chapter on Slovenia? On Tina, actually. Yeah, th this is my travel memoir. I wrote this during the pandemic lockdown. I took a sabbatical and uh, basically it's called The Temporary European. And it's the collection of my favorite travel stories from my 23 years of working with Rick. And there's a whole chapter at the beginning about Bosnian coffee with our friend and most star Alma. And there's also a whole chapter about Tina, actually, Tina's family and our friendship over the years. And Tina's wonderful dad, who's also a mountain guide. He takes people on driving trips around the Julian Alps that we were just talking about. And uh, lots of other stories from this part of the world. There's a whole chapter on the Dalmatian coast and what it's like to live in these places that are so popular with so many tourists from the perspective of the locals. So yeah, uh, it's called The Temporary European. You can get it at ricksteves.com and anywhere books are sold. And you're right. I did notice, I don't know how long this will last. It might be ending very soon, but Amazon has a screaming deal on Kindle, $1.99 for the Kindle edition. It's usually 10 bucks. Um, it could be gone as soon as tomorrow because it's usually about a week and I think it's been going on about a week. So if you want to go get it on Kindle on amazon.com, it's $2 right now. Okay, a few more questions. Wynn wants to know, can you go into the lakes at Plibitza? No. no. Okay, excellent. Antonia wants to know, was Istria part of Italy prior to World War II? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and now we can have a little bit longer answers. Um, I'll, I'll just follow up on that. Yes, Istria was, a, it's, it's a bicultural region. I'll just quickly say it's still bilingual. So officially it still speaks both Italian and Croatian. And I, I for me, it's the most Italian feeling part of Croatia, even though it's a, a, a part of Croatia and so forth. Culturally, it just has that kind of uh, Italian feel to it. 
Okay. Um, let's see, Kathy, and actually several other people wanted to know, why is it called the Dalmatian coast? Uh, because the coastline of Croatia is divided into three areas. Um, and you basically have the Istrian Peninsula, you have the Kvarner, and then you have Dalmatia. And it is because of the tribes, the Dalmati, that actually moved here um, from the mountains. And they are known as very tall people. Uh, usually people of Mediterranean are extremely short, well, shorter. Um, when you come down to split and then further down, everybody's just saying, what, is everybody here a basketball player or what? Um, but yeah, it's the Dalmati tribe that actually gave the name of Dalmatia, not the dog. Yeah, it's the other way around. The dog's <laughs> name came from the coast, not the coast from the dogs. <laughs> I looked all over Dubrovnik for one of those dogs and I didn't see one. But you don't Very see hard to find. No, no, very hard to find. <laughs> Um, Tina, did you say something about animal noises? Did I hear that while I was in the Q&A? Animal noises? Yeah, did you say that if we came on tour oh. with you, we would hear you do some... No, you said you'd explain which animals like which kind of hay. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which animals <laughs> like what kind of hay? Because I have a neighbor over here that always talks about how, you know, sometimes you put the hay into those um, big plastic wrappers and the cows actually don't mind eating either but the horses are the picky ones you know and they eat only the one that's air dried if there's such <laughs> thing as air dried hay if well, anybody don't you have some pretty more, don't you yeah, have some do. pretty fancy horses in slovenia yeah we do we do have the lipitzaners um, that a lot of people say that they are austrian well lipica actually is a name for linden tree that is a very common tree in our country and lipica means a small linden tree where the city of lipica was established and back in the 1580s also the first stud farm was open okay uh, linda wants to know how did croatia end up with all the coastline it's you know, historically, a lot of the coastline was, just, that's how the, the borders were traveling. Um, that's how it was back in the day. Um, the boomerang shaped country was actually established by creating the buffer zone during the times of the Ottoman invasions. Um, and that was back in the 1500s. And then uh, there is a certain section that you can see, um, a little tiny section of Croatian coastline is, also um, belonging to Bosnia. So not really, it, it is Bosnian territory. So it kind of feels like that it is split in two, but that goes again back into the times of the Ottoman invasions. Ottomans were actually getting into Bosnia. At that point, uh, Croatia was not Croatia. It was incorporated into the Venetian Republic and part that is lower down from where Bosnian coastline is was actually Dubrovnik Republic. And Dubrovnik Republic wanted a little bit of protection because the Venetians always wanted to take over them. And in order to get that protection, they actually gave the Ottomans a bit of the access to, to able to reach Bosnia, which was their territory back in the day. And that is how historically they got only 10 kilometers off the coastline. That's fascinating. Okay, uh, Lucinda wants to know how easy would it be for a woman to travel alone in the Balkans and um, she specifically would like to use public transportation? Yeah, I, I would say not a big deal. If you go throughout Slovenia and Croatia with public transportation, um, only from split down, it's easier to travel on catamarans and boats and buses than it is um, with a train. Um, so that's something. But other, other than that, there's Flixbus. That is a very good way to travel around. Um, it's really well connected with all the major cities of the Balkans, including Sarajevo and Belgrade as well. Um, and yeah, as a, not a problem at all. You also have to know that a lot of people sometimes ask when they go into Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know, they are um, always saying, oh, will every, all the women be covered? No, because our... Um, you know, our religion was not so important back in the days of Yugoslavia. Um, as you know, communism doesn't really walk hand in hand with the religion. 
Uh, so that's why everything was a little looser. So for example, when you come into Bosnia, uh, women that are covered are mostly visitors from foreign countries and not really local local girls. Local girls, you can find them with a very deep cleavage and a very mini skirt, uh, mm -hmm. being very non-modestly dressed. And people sometimes are very surprised as well as sometimes um, you don't find pork on the menu, but you would definitely uh, find some arachia or the see-through alcoholic drink that we also strongly believe in that is good for our health purposes. So it's a bit different. Yeah, I would say not not a worry at all. I I, I wouldn't be really worried. Cameron, what I do can... you I, I would just say, Lisa, you were you traveled solo as a woman in Croatia last fall. I ran into you in a couple of places. How did you feel about it as a as a confident woman traveler? Did it feel any different to you in Croatia than other places? No, um, I actually felt really, really safe there. And even though you know, I saw you in Split and I saw you in Dubrovnik, and these are places with lots of narrow passageways and dark, what we might think of as spooky, and I felt very, very safe. Um, I really liked my trip. I, I told you all about it. But Cameron, yeah. So this this question is for you. How do you feel about driving in Croatia and Slovenia? I really love driving in Slovenia and Croatia. I would say it's for me one of the easiest places to drive in a lot of ways in Europe. The roads are in excellent repair, super highways. It's very fast to get around. Things are well marked. Traffic is not too heavy. Maybe in the summer along the Dalmatian coast, it gets pretty backed up. Um, it gives you a lot of freedom. In this region, I find there are areas that you want a car and areas you don't want a car. So if you're island hopping on the Dalmatian coast, you do not want a car because like Tina said, there's excellent catamarans and boats and buses that connect that. But if you want to drive up into the Julian Alps that we showed you at the end in Slovenia, that's a place you want a car. So my philosophy in this area is rather than have a rental car for the entire trip, you do one strategically for a day or two here and there where it makes the most sense. Or you hire a driver. We have uh, several uh, professional private drivers in Dubrovnik that we recommend in our guidebook. And basically they're busy all year long taking our readers on day trips to Montenegro, to Mostar, wine tasting at Pelia Shots. You don't want a car if you're in Dubrovnik for five days every day. You want one or two days where you can go do a little day trip. And it's very efficient to hire a driver to take you on those day trips rather than to rent a car and deal with the hassle of figuring out parking and having to return it and so forth. Um, so I would say that's a combination of mostly public transportation, rent a car maybe for a few days where it makes sense, or hire a driver for day trips. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And um, our last question is um, from Cheryl. And she wants to know, she was very interested in the truffles that you talked about in the Istrian Peninsula. Um, are there truffle festivals and when would they be? Yeah, usually they are in the city of Motovun, just down beneath the city of Motovun in the area close to Zigante restaurant. Uh, that is where the largest truffle has been found. And they usually take place um, in October and up until the mid of November every weekend. Um, and it really doesn't matter when, but from about mid-October to mid-November, you always have every single weekend there's truffles on. Fantastic. Yeah, last, yeah. last fall I was in that in that exact area and I missed the festival by a week. Uh -huh. I think it was uh -huh. middle of Oct uh, late yeah. September. But yeah. the, the white truffles had arrived, so you could get white truffles in the restaurants fresh, but the festival yeah. was starting a week or two later. So there's a there's a window there in the fall. Yeah, and together with the with the truffles, if you're interested, you can also um, go truffle hunting, yeah. uh, which is also a very cool activity uh, that you can do with some local folks. There's a lot of people that are doing that around the area of Motovun. Well, thank you very much. Cameron, I will retreat until it's time for me to say goodnight. All right. Well, thank you so much. I actually wanted to give um, Tina a chance to have any final words. Thank you for joining us tonight, Tina. Did you have any any parting thoughts, parting wisdom for our people watching tonight? I would I would say just come to our part of the world. Don't be afraid of it. It's extremely beautiful. Come on an empty stomach because we have a lot of great food and a lot of amazing scenery. It's very safe. I think Slovenia, to be told, is one of the safest countries of the world, not just of Europe. Um, so yeah, do come and visit and thank you for listening. Um, it's always a pleasure um, talking about my part of the world um, and representing it around the world because I think it's a little too less known um, and we just love it when people come 
and visit. So thank you, Cameron, as well, for including us in all your travels. And thank you, Lisa, for hosting us. <laughs>